Yvonne, you went to film school in LA, mm -hmm. but then you moved back to the Bay Area after finishing. Why is that? Um, I went to school at Oxnard College, and I, when I went there, I was actually undecided. Um, I tried out different uh, studies. I went into philosophy, economics, politics, because um, I was trying to find really what was my venue to really affect the world. I come from a family that dedicated their life to it. So eventually, around my junior year, Occidental College was cool because they allowed you to take your time to figure it out. And I, after taking some classes, I realized that film was really my, my tool. And I grabbed onto that. And so I stayed in LA, obviously, because it made sense. I mean, you're in LA, you're studying film. Um, but I started to become, uh, I got into the camera world. So I was a cameraman for um, the show called Mundos. That was part of Telemundo's like Spanish MTV type thing. And it was fun. I mean, at 23, 24, I was filming everywhere, concerts. Um, I was having fun. But, you know, you kind of become a cameraman. That's what I kept being called for. And I wanted to write and direct. And, you know, I started being a PA and did a, a few independent projects. But being from the Bay originally, I knew that there was um, a lot of being a filmmaker's access and knowing people. And I knew more people in the Bay. And I actually don't have a huge love for LA in terms of living here. So I was drawn to go back. And uh, I knew a friend from high school. His dad is a pretty well-known documentary filmmaker. And I went back to do work on actually another doc of a friend of mine, just to actually edit. And I shot in Chile and edited that project in the Bay. And being there, I reconnected with his friend. We started doing music videos reconnected with his dad and I started working in documentaries because um, Berkeley is a, it's a mecca for documentary filmmaking. There's this building there that has a ton of filmmakers, a big, strong community. And uh, I ended up just staying there and working in documentaries for like four or five years. Do you still come back to LA aside from this video here and, and your screening tonight or, or coming up? Yeah, you have to come back to LA. Um, I have a lot of friends here that work in different styles uh, music videos or um, some have their own channels on youtube and you know i still work in production um, i have to compensate not just being a director or writer but i also shoot and um yeah you have to come back to it every once in a while do you think there's a difference in well, it sounds so like cliche and pretentious but like artistic expression in the bay area versus here in la is is there a difference definitely i feel in the Bay, at least, I won't say everywhere outside of LA, but in the Bay, people are really trying to focus on stories that mean something to them personally and to their community. I think in Oakland, that's the thing. If you watch the films that are coming out of the Bay, they're very much about local experiences and, and, and the town plays a role. You know, that city, that area, or San Francisco and The Last Black Man, you know, it's a character. And, you know, there's been movies in LA, obviously, that have that. But a lot of people here are just trying to make moves, to entertain. They're trying to get a job, you know? And I feel like in the Bay, there's a lot more about it being an art form and a form of expression to their personal experience. Your bio says you moved from Chile to the Bay Area in 1995? Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you think spending a good chunk of the beginning of your life in an area where a lot of artists were silenced? Mm -hmm affected your need to want to tell stories? Uh, uh, yeah, growing up in Latin America, I grew up in like eight different countries in Latin America. We moved around a lot. And I was always surrounded by people who were exiles from Chile, who people, people whose stories were, were silenced. It was dangerous to tell your truth. And I've, I've realized more and more as I, as I grow older that that's definitely my main motivation is to tell stories that um, don't fit into the mainstream, that challenge the mainstream, and that are from voices who are usually pushed back or silenced. And yeah, I didn't realize at the time, but a lot of being an exile and fighting against a regime that's trying to silence you, um, storytelling is kind of therapy. Storytelling is, yeah, a means of survival and a means of organizing. And so for me, filmmaking is that. I, I grab onto that and I, every project I work on, it has to address um, the society we live in, has to address people 
that are uh, at the margins and it has to be used as a tool to change things. Well, I know you've done documentaries on um, different uh, journalists, I think, and then Pedro Guerrero, the mm -hmm. photographer. Mm -hmm. So in an age where now everyone can tell a story and it's almost encouraged and everybody's supposed to be a quote unquote influencer, mm -hmm. in whatever their little niche is, how is that for you, knowing you grew up around a lot of people that were fearful of saying anything? How does that work in your mind? Huh. You know, it's interesting because my family uh, is still nervous about sharing their story. You know, like for, for my parents, it's even hard to say what they went through. And so sometimes, even now in an interview, you know, I have this, this weird, like, subconscious barrier sometimes to be fully open about what you've been through and so in filmmaking it and when you interview people i i really understand that when you're interviewing somebody and you're doing documentaries you're almost like having a very vulnerable moment and you have to really appreciate that value that and respect that um and the same thing in fiction um you know our project where the north pole and different projects i've worked on you you're telling real people stories. The North Pole is about real people that we know in our community. And so you have to really acknowledge that that could be something very vulnerable, that could be something very intimate, and that you're exposing it to the world. And that's your responsibility to do it right. And I think that that relationship to truth and to personal history is something that I am very careful about and respectful about. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, yeah, absolutely. This is a little more of a lighter question. A movie that you were embarrassed to admit that you love, The Princess Bride? Yeah. <laughs> How did you find it out? Um, One of our interns. Oh. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's funny. I'm, uh, I rarely allow myself to watch something just for fun. But I think it was really fun and well made and memorable. I mean, Inigo Montoya, you know, even watching that movie before I knew English fully, like, I remembered him and he was like stuck with me. Um, and if a movie can do that, I think it's a big success. But as a filmmaker, you say you don't see that many films? I don't. Why is that? I think two hours of your life is a long time to spend doing anything. And so I don't consume film in that way or TV or streaming. I, I like playing soccer. I like hanging out. I like doing other forms of art. Um, I like spending time with real people. And so I actually have a lot of friends I trust their taste and I know my taste. And once I hear like a few solid recommendations about something, I'll go and watch it. There's obviously certain things that I have my eye on and like, you know, anything that comes out of the bay, I'm gonna watch regardless. Um, anything that has controversy and people are like, oh, and it deals with social justice. Um, even if most people hate it, I'm gonna watch it because I have to have an opinion. But most things that are like, oh, that was cool, I'm not gonna watch it. Like, why? So I'm, I'm pretty picky, I guess. And it has to move me, you know, it has to inspire me. And so if I'm going to learn something, I definitely want to watch it. And if, or if it's a commentary on something I care about, then I, I want to have a discourse with it, you know? So why the North Pole? What, why you, you launched a crowdfunding campaign or two? Mm -hmm. This is your second series, is it? Second season for the North season? Pole. Okay. I definitely think it fulfills all my requirements to watch it. <laughs> it's going to make you think. Um, it definitely has a stance. And I feel like almost anybody can learn something from it. And it's based on real people's experience in, in our town in Oakland, but it's very relatable to a lot of cities in this country. I mean, it's kind of like uh, a symbol of, uh, of an experience that's happening a lot in the country. You know? Did you see something similar happen growing up in Chile or whatever area you grew up, different years? I know gentrification wasn't a thing I grew up with in Latin America, but definitely, you know, at the core of gentrification is a class issue. That's definitely at the core of my experience in Latin America, you know, and, and, and in the world. And calling it what it is, you know, it's a class struggle is, is something that nobody says in the show, but in my ideology, that's what's happening. It's uh, gentrification is a green issue. And rich people in, in the Bay, San Francisco being one of the richest uh, cities in the world, and how that starts affecting the surrounding areas 
and folks who aren't don't have access to that capital. Um, that experience is worldwide. And then, you know, there, our second season is, is about an immigrant. It's about an undocumented immigrant. And that story is based on uh, a friend of mine since high school who actually um, used to lie to us. He said he was Puerto Rican. And uh, it took him like 10 years to reveal that he was actually Salvadorian. And so, you know, and I've seen him go through his life with, with struggles who at the time I didn't understand why, but, you know, he wanted to be a fireman. He wanted to be an airline pilot. And he was never able to achieve that, you know. I was on the first plane he flew, a um, small little Cessna, and it was scary. But that experience um, is similar to in my childhood. I was surrounded by exiles, which are, in essence, people who are forced to immigrate. Um, and, and yeah, those, those experiences of feeling like you don't belong and you're not accepted and you have to hide who you are is definitely part of, like, um, my family's history and my community. And a close friend of mine, who I, I, um, we use as an inspiration. It's a loose inspiration, but we use as, as an inspiration for Benny, the main character. Whose idea was it to begin writing the show? Um, it was initially uh, me, Josh Healy, and Darren Colston got together. I mean, me and Josh had been working on a, a handful of other projects that were kind of one-offs, um, dealing with, you know, we had one with Boots Riley, about a climate justice march that occurred. We did one for that. We did another one dealing with immigration. So they were all kind of one-off pieces. You know, we did one against uh, fracking, um, attacking Jerry Brown in a nice way. <laughs> and, um, but we kept talking about, let's do something bigger. You know, let's get into characters. Let's, let's tell a longer story. And so we all had that motivation. So the three of us got together, uh, went on a little mini retreat and just started brainstorming and coming up with characters and ideas and planning out what would be this world. And that's where it came out of. Would you write on your own and then bring it back to the two other gentlemen and say? No, the first season was the three of us um, brainstorming together a lot. Josh was definitely the, the lead writer. And that meant that we would all brainstorm and he would go and chop things down and then I would tell him he was wrong. And then he would tell me otherwise. And that's, you know, that's how we created um, the show on different characters. And the second season, um, Darren became just a producer. And we brought on um, the leads, two of the leads, uh, Dante Clark and Reina Amaya. And then it became this four-person room. And same thing, Josh being the showrunner. And then the four of us just, you know, getting creative together. You wrote another screenplay, American Babylon, mm -hmm. which you won an award for, or you won a grant. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the screenplay about? Uh, American Babylon takes place in 2001, the summer of 2001, and it follows a 26-year-old exile from Chile. I don't know how I came up with that. <laughs> and uh, he, he mostly just wants to ignore the world around him and be happy and, and be chill and take care of his sick uncle, who's an ex-revolutionary from Chile who... It's kind of this, if, uh, he recycles, he builds crosses for the church he stays at. He's kind of this hermit. And uh, the main character also barters weed. So he, he lives in this underground economy, but it's some bartering. And his girlfriend, uh, Satya, a black girl from Oakland, who goes to UC Berkeley, studies history. She's an activist. She's organizing a march. So she's always pushing him to care and to get involved. And the world around him. Back in 2001, you know, Bush had just stolen the elections and Oakland was up in arms and there was huge marches against um, globalization. So the world was very active. And so my film is like dealing with that world and it pushing our main character to care. But he avoids it until his uncle gets sick. He can't afford to take care of him. He's forced to switch from bartering to selling weed by kind of breaking his, his mode of operating in the world. Eventually, in the march that the girlfriend uh, organizes, uh, riot police shut it down. It's a peaceful march, but she gets hit and arrested and taken away for a while. And all these things trigger the main character's memories of his parents being killed in a dictatorship in Chile. And so these, these dreams slash nightmares start reoccurring and pushing him, and he ends up kind of breaking and joining the group of his girlfriend, and they all decide to take an action. 
And because of its history, they decide to they pick a day for an action based on a day that started the dictatorship in Chile. And eventually um, it becomes a, an argument between them about doing a violent or a nonviolent action. The girlfriend is definitely about nonviolence, very much like an MLK character and embodying that ideology. And the main character, because of his experience and his past, cannot do anything but do a violent act. And it's not about killing anybody, but it's about property destruction. They pick a company that had a history to this military coup. The U.S. was heavily involved in the military coup in Chile. So the film is like connecting these dots and eventually they go into this. It becomes like a heist film and they go to do this action. They're in a plaza in San Francisco with two big screens on both sides in the financial district. They get, there's a snitch, they get surrounded by the police, guns drawn, and 9-11 happens in the screens. And that's the film. And it's, it's based on real history. Um, a lot of people don't know it, but the dictatorship in Chile occurred on September 11th, 1973. So all my life and all Chileans' lives, 9-11 has been a day that we, that we mourn or you celebrate, depends on what side you're on, but a day for sure that marks our history. And so when 9-11 happened here, I was at Oxy right here in LA, I, I still get chills. Like, how is that possible? And they're very similar events. I mean, there's airplanes, bombing the National Palace in Chile and airplanes hitting a building here on a Tuesday in the morning. It's just like really weird. So it comes from a place of me having two 9-11s in my life to kind of grapple and to address this cycle of violence. You know, like violence begets more violence is the theme of my film and how we, one, cannot have a historical amnesia and not acknowledge what's happened in the past. Because if we do, things will keep happening and we need to learn how to deal with these things in a healthier way. That's kind of my crazy film. How long did it take you to write that? Well, the initial idea, I mean, the ending came to me a few days after 9-11. I mean, I was like, I have to connect these. Um, but, you know, that's a long time ago. And then um, realistically, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I sat down and wrote my first solid draft. Then I applied to the SF Films, uh, Rain and Grant, and I got a screenwriting grant for that. And since then, I've been, you know, I've done a few drafts. I went to this amazing lab called the Sine Qua Non Lab that takes place in Mexico, small town in San, with mentors and 13 other filmmakers and really like took my screenplay to a new level. Um, yeah, so it's been a solid two and a half years really working um, hard at it. Yeah. Is it hard for you to work on it? Is it does it bring up uh, that's a good question. memories or, or, or sort of an anger? I mean, that's the thing I had to realize at this lab is that uh, unconsciously I was definitely protecting this character. You know, he's not me, but he's definitely somebody who has a similar experience to me. I have both my parents, thankfully, so I don't have the pain that he does, but I still was protecting him emotionally. And in a screenplay in a movie, you have to push your characters to, to feel, you know, to, to go rock bottom and uh so yeah i've had to open up you know my own personal fears my own personal traumas to allow this character to go there and yeah the screenplay is way better because of that you know you have to allow yourself to to feel and to yeah go to your dark side is that something you would recommend to other writers don't don't protect your main character as close as, as they may feel to them? Absolutely. I mean, one of the main lessons, so the girlfriend, I, this is a genius advice I got in, you know, there's a, it's, this, my film is a story that has a huge backstory. It's not seen in the film, right? His parents get assassinated, which is like the biggest emotionally backstory you can have. A character loses his parents, right? So an equivalent to that, you have to balance that out with the present film. Otherwise, why are you telling the present and not the past, you know? And... So something just as emotional needs to occur in your present, in the film. It needs to happen to this character. That pain needs to happen to this character. How do you achieve that? You know, How do you achieve a trauma of a past to affect the present? So I'm not doing this, but a recommendation or a logical deduction of that is like, I have to kill the girlfriend, right? Like somebody has to die. The uncle has to die. Somebody has to kill. But even if you're not going to make that choice as a writer because you don't feel it's right, you have to try it. And by doing so, by pushing to the edge, like killing somebody, one of your characters, you're going to learn what you need to do 
what you miss, what, what you can gain from that kind of experiment. And so I highly recommend when you're dealing with highly emotional things to, yeah, push it to the limit, not as just a gimmick, but to learn what this does to your character and to your story. And it helped me a lot to kill her for like three days. <laughs> she comes back to life? No, she oh, never does, no, but I I'm see. saying I, I practiced, I, I worked out the film in a way. What happens if she does get killed? You know, and like, what does that mean to the character? What does that trigger? And how that can I, I don't want to tell you, but how does that, how can you achieve a symbolic death in a way? You know, and that's what I had to do is figure out a way that she in a way dies. But not that simple. So you've done work with American Masters? Mm -hmm. PPS? Is that yeah. Right? yeah. And uh, if someone comes to you, let's say 60, 70 years from now, a young filmmaker, as you've done with... Um, was it Pedro Guerrero or, mm -hmm. or different other stories that you've done? And they say, we want to do a movie about your life. Mm -hmm. well, what, do you, what do you envision the, the core takeaway being? I realize that's, that's many years in the future, but um, yeah. if somebody said, we want to spend time with you, we want you to turn over your photographs or your different images mm -hmm. and be vulnerable in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think the, the, the core message of the movie would be? Um, well, ideally, it's uh, sacrificing, I don't know what the word, dedicating yourself to use whatever, I use art, I use film, but dedicating your life to affecting change. I think uh, if you focus on my childhood, my parents are a huge influence in that, and the world I grew up in was people sacrificing their life to, you know, overthrow a dictatorship that was killing and disappearing people. And then, you know, this kid moving to the U.S. to a time with real no movements in comparison to Latin America and no solid cause to grab onto and figuring out how to continue that legacy. And hopefully I can be an inspiration in film in general and artists to go back to a lot of people have done in the past using film as a as a much more poignant and activating tool to transform society ideally that would be my legacy but i have to create a few more things too um, and learn i think continue learning how to um, affect people emotionally and inspire them to change yeah I know Haight Ashbury and that whole flower child generation up there in the Bay Area mm. was very much about, you know, fighting for different causes. I don't remember Generation X when I was up there being into that. Mm. I, I think it seems like there's definitely a renewed yeah. interest. Well, the 80s were tough. So the 80s is when they won and they shut us down and made it totally unrealistic to have dreams, you know, and you just had to make money. And I think that's where we've been. We've been where our generation, I'm born in 1980. For generation is like, oh, dreaming and thinking big and trying to change the world, that doesn't work. You know, that's what we've been told. And I feel like the 80s were definitely about, you know, making money in the 90s and everything in pop culture. Still is a lot about that, but there is a switch. I mean, there is, there's a, a shift happening where we need to transform our value system, you know, and stop. It's not money over people. And I think art needs to start challenging that even more and start telling stories that reimagine our future and change how we interact with each other. And remind us of the past. I mean, we have to go back and, I mean, Hollywood, there's a lot of people who are blacklisted who are telling stories that are very different from the mainstream. And that's, you know, you can't discount that. You can't say, oh, that just happened. That was on purpose. People were silenced and taken out of the biggest, most powerful, influential tool in the world, which is making movies. And so where are those voices now and how do we repair that lack of participation?